This is Outdoor Emergency Care, Chapter 4, Incident Command and Triage. All right, I'm not going to go into a tremendous amount of detail about incident command systems because you will all be taking the online NIMS National Incident Management Systems class over winter break. The principles of incident command are used throughout emergency services and related fields like healthcare and government and allow you to manage a very small incident all the way up through something like the entire state of California being on fire with wildfires. So you need to know some common terminology and vocabulary to understand how this works and what your role in an incident command system would be. A full-scale incident command structure has five major functional areas, which are command, operations, planning, logistics, and finance. Now, for most incidents, planning, logistics, and finance are not going to be a formal part of the command structure, but they pretty much take care of themselves through the normal course of events. They do become important when you have a large disaster type situation and somebody needs to figure out how we're going to pay for it, where we're going to get supplies to deal with it, and how many more people we need to handle the situation. At every incident, there's an incident commander. For most ski patrol incidents, that is the first ski patroller to arrive on scene unless or until they transfer command to someone else like a supervisor that arrives on scene. The incident commander is responsible for making sure that the incident gets handled, and the way that they're supposed to do this is by delegating tasks to the people working for them. Any task not delegated by the incident commander remains the responsibility of the incident commander, so you can understand why they want to delegate as many tasks as they can. When there are multiple responders present working on an incident, the best practice is for the incident commander to go hands off so they can stand back and see the big picture and not become saturated with task level things like trying to fasten the buckles on the backboard. The incident commander can also appoint command staff, which are some special officers. And the important one for you to know is the safety officer and what you need to know about them will become clear in just a moment. Every person working in an incident command structure should have only one boss telling them what to do. And this is a principle of incident command systems called unity of command. The one exception to the unity of command rule is the safety officer. And the safety officer is entitled to tell absolutely anyone on the scene to stop doing what they're doing if it's unsafe. If you're in the middle of the command structure and you are a boss of other people, you should have between three and seven underlings, and five is the ideal number, and this is called the span of control. So if you think about a huge incident and the incident commander has filled out their functional areas, so they have an operations section chief, a logistics chief, planning chief, finance chief, they have a safety officer, and he has to talk to dispatch on the radio. That's already six people that want to talk to him all the time, and he's basically going to be maxed out. So we split up these gaggles of bosses and underlings into sections, which are the big four operations, logistics, planning, and finance. And then under operations would be branches, which could be functional, like medical, fire, or police, big functions that have to happen. Or if the whole county is underwater, maybe you have a north branch and a south branch. And under that are divisions, which are geographical. So we could have Holtz Division and Winslow Division. There are groups which are functional, so we might have a toboggan group and a lift evac group. If we had a mass casualty incident and had to evacuate the chairlift at the same time. There are task forces, which are different resources working together to accomplish a goal. So you might have a road repair task force of two bulldozers, a backhoe, and a dump truck and their job is to open the road that got flooded. 
or a strike team, which are a bunch of all the same thing working together. So you can have a helicopter strike team of seven helicopters all going to go dump water on the forest fire. So when would we use an incident command structure? Well, if you think about the refresher or every OEC class, we basically use an incident command structure that there's an incident commander who's the training officer. There's a safety officer, which is usually me. I wander around and tell people not to do stupid things. There are divisions, which are geographical or possibly their groups if they're functional, five stations, and each station has a leader and underlings. And we activate the logistics section to make sure that we have the equipment there and that everybody gets lunch. But for real, this brings us to mass casualty incidents. And this happened at Sugarloaf, Maine in 2010, that they had a chairlift derail from a single tower and continue to run for a distance before it stopped. And they had eight patients and they had to evacuate the chairlift. So when the first patrollers arrived on scene, this was what they saw. So a mass casualty incident or multiple casualty incident is defined as a situation involving two or more patients where the number of patients exceeds the capability of the immediately available resources. So when our resources are exceeded, we need to decide how to allocate them. And our process of determining which patients get which resources is called triage, which comes from a French word meaning to sort. In the beginning phase of an incident, we sort the patients into four categories, which are immediate, delayed, minimal, and expectant. And the way that we do this is through the use of the start triage system. And there's a video which you will be able to watch that explains this in great detail, but I'm also going to explain it to you, so hang on. When you arrive on scene and you realize that you have a multiple casualty incident, the immediate actions taken by the first arriving rescuers are going to have a big impact on how the incident gets handled overall. So step number one is to realize that there's a multiple casualty incident establish incident command and get on the radio to patrol dispatch so that they can call Hanover, declare the mass casualty incident, and get ambulances and additional help on the way. If as the first responder you immediately wade into the masses and start talking to patients, you're not going to be able to give that clear concise report on the radio and it's not going to go that well. The information that dispatch needs from the first arriving patroller is what happened, what's the mechanism of injury, and then a ballpark head count of patients. Are there four, are there 40, are there 400? What are we looking at? It's also important to realize what your resources are that exist in the upper valley, how much of a strain a mass casualty incident is going to put on the EMS and hospital resources, and how long it's going to take to get enough ambulances to the skiway to deal with the situation. So here's the upper valley. You are here. The skiway is here. And Hanover has two ambulances. And Lebanon has an ambulance in Lebanon, ambulance in West Lebanon. Hartford's got two ambulances. Canaan's got an ambulance but they gotta come the long way around down the dirt road. Upper Valley Ambulance has one or maybe two ambulances. And that's really it for your, our immediate response to the skiway. Beyond that, we start getting into Windsor has a couple ambulances, Woodstock, Vermont's got an ambulance, New London's got an ambulance. Grafton has an ambulance, but it's volunteer. Enfield has an ambulance, but it's volunteer, so they may or may not be available during the daytime. Claremont has a couple ambulances, Golden Cross ambulance down there, but that's really it. Once you get beyond that, then you're looking at Woodsville, New Hampshire, and Barrytown in Vermont. So you're looking at eight, eight to 10 ambulances available within the first half hour of the call. 
And beyond that, you get into an hour, hour and a half to get enough ambulances to really move a lot of people. The hospitals, DHMC and APD, the VA hospital, if we had a multiple casualty incident, we'll be able to take some patients. And then we get into outlying hospitals, New London Hospital and Valley Regional. And each of these, DHMC is the only trauma center. It's the only one that's really going to be able to deal with severely injured patients. So anything that goes to one of these outlying hospitals or that ends up up here or out here in Vermont somewhere is going to probably end up getting flown somewhere and will not get the care that they need if they have a surgical trauma emergency. In each top shack and the aid room, we have a stash of triage tags. As soon as those arrive at the scene or sooner, you can assign a patroller to begin triage using the start system. And the first part of the start system is to tell everyone who can get up and walk to get up and get out of the way and give them a specific location to go to. So if this happens on a ski trail, you can tell them, everybody get up, go over to the right side of the trail and sit on the snowmaking pipe. And that's perfectly fine. Or they can start walking down the hill. All these patients who were able to get up and walk are assumed to be minimally injured so they are the green triage category. Then you start where you stand and the first patient that you come to is the first patient that you triage using the mnemonic RPM. And we'll go through how to do this for an adult, which is pretty simple, and then we'll discuss what to do with children, which is slightly different. For an adult, when you come to them, they weren't able to get up and walk away. The first letter is R, which stands for respirations. Number one, are they breathing? If they're not breathing, reposition the airway, head tilt, chin lift. And if they don't start breathing, unfortunately, they are considered deceased or expectant. We put a black triage tag on them. We're assuming that we do not have enough rescuers to do rescue breathing or CPR and still take care of all the other patients. If they are breathing, we look at the rate. If the rate's greater than 30 breaths per minute, which is a breath every two seconds, that's bad. And we assume they're going into shock or have a respiratory problem. We put a red immediate triage tag on them. If their respiratory rate is less than 30, then we go on to P, which stands for perfusion. So P for perfusion, we're looking for adequate perfusion in the form of capillary refill less than two seconds, which doesn't always happen in the cold environment. You can also see if they have radial pulses that you can palpate and is their skin warm, pink and dry, or is it pale, cool and clammy? If their perfusion looks poor, like they're going into shock, we tag them red immediate and move on to the next patient. If they have adequate breathing and adequate perfusion, then we go to M, which stands for mental status. For mental status, we need to determine whether the patient can follow simple commands like open your eyes, squeeze my hands, what's your name? If they can do that, then they've passed RPM and they get tagged yellow, which is delayed. And these are people who have a broken leg and can't walk, but they're not going to die. Anyone who's unconscious but is breathing is automatically going to be made a red because they're going to fail mental status. So an easy way to remember this for adults is RPM is 32 can do. 30 breaths per minute, capillary refill less than two seconds, and can they follow simple commands? Now for kids, and this is not in the textbook, but it's kind of important, particularly for us at the Skiway where we're loaded with kids all the time. The difference for kids are in respiration, if they're not breathing, you can stop and take the time to give them five rescue breaths. And if they start breathing again after five rescue breaths, then we tag them red and move on to the next patient. If they don't start breathing, then they get tagged deceased black tag. 
If they are breathing, their respiratory rate is allowed to be between 15 and 45. If it's too slow or too fast, they get red tagged immediate. And for kids, we're less concerned with capillary refill, even more so than in adults. So we're just looking for that palpable radial pulse. If they don't have radial pulses, we tag them immediate. Also, you need to be aware of any children that got picked up and carried away from the scene by a green patient who was able to walk. And those kids who were carried or not able to walk need to also get triaged. Also along those lines, the other thing to be aware of is that lots of patients are going to transport themselves and they're not gonna wait to be triaged, treated, or transported by ski patrol or by ambulance. So those people are gonna leave in their own car and start showing up at the hospitals. So the hospital may already be overwhelmed with patients by the time our first patient gets there in an ambulance. Ideally, we'd like to be able to corral these people and at least identify them and know who they are for documentation purposes, but in the first moments of a disaster, they may not realistically happen. And we don't really wanna be in the position of preventing people from leaving if they want to. Frankly, it makes our job easier if they leave. Once all the patients have been triaged, the deceased patients will be left in place. The immediate red tag patients will start being quickly treated on the scene, but most importantly, loaded into toboggans and removed to the treatment area or casualty collection point, which may be in the aid room or upstairs in the lodge, or depending on the situation, it may be in the snowcat garage, the snowmaking building, or the Ford Sayer building. It's going to be a game time call based on the situation. Once all the reds have been transported off the scene, you can start on the yellows. And as the patients arrive in the treatment area, they will be re-triaged to make sure their condition hasn't changed and any necessary treatment initiated or continued. And as ambulances arrive, the worst of the reds will be transported first and then the yellows and then the greens. That concludes the presentation on Incident Command and Triage.